Yes? Okay. Uh, welcome to the Hillsborough Township Planning Board Public Meeting of December 11, 2014. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting has been duly advertised according to Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, the Sunshine Law. Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Julian? Here. Mr. Peason? Here. Mr. Lapani? Here. Vice Chairman Cohen? Here. Deputy Mayor Bruchette? Here. Chairman Dr. Sreese? Here. Uh, first order of business is actually to appoint a temporary secretary for this meeting. Uh, I move Rob Peason. Second. Any other nominations for temporary secretary? Seeing none, motion to close and appoint Rob as temporary secretary for the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Rob. That's how you can sign documents. Very good. Next up, disposition of minutes. We have the minutes of the public meeting of December the 4th, last week. They were sent to uh, all the board members, Dr. Chip Mm-hmm. Mr. Burchette, Mr. Julian, and Mr. LaPagna are eligible. So moved. Second. Any comments? Roll call. Yes. Deputy Mayor Burchette? Yes. Mr. LaPagna? Yes. Who is the third one? I'm sorry. And Mr. Julian? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next up is resolutions. Resol uh, the first is uh, resolution recommending uh, a uh, study area. Uh, block 163.05, lots 101, 102, 3, 104, 105, as an area in need of rehabilitation. Mr. Chairman, this mm -hmm. is a memorialization of an action taken by the board last Thursday. It mm -hmm. has already been approved, but for purposes of submitting it to the committee for future consideration, we have memorialized it, and the resolution is before the board. Uh, Mr. Julian. Mr. LePan, Mr. LePani and Mr. Burchette are all eligible for this one. Okay. So moved. Second. Any comment? Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Burchette. Yes. Mr. LePani. Yes. Mr. Julian. Yes. Sorry for the spelling. So the next two are going to be the same. Uh, the next. No. Well, no? the next one is, is the same. Is is. Okay. As the board will recall, there were two issues before it last week. One was the area in need of rehabilitation. And the other was an area in need of redevelopment. This is the resolution memorializing the actions of the board on that matter as well, Mr. Chairman. The same three people. Okay. Your motion? I moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Burchette. Yes. Mr. Lapani. Yes. Mr. Julian. Yes. Uh, next up, a resolution recommending endorsement of the NJDOT Section 15N of U.S. Route 206. Mr. Yes. Chairman. Yes. In a recent meeting at DOT headquarters in Trenton, um, attended by our mayor, Douglas Thompson, by our administrator, Anthony Ferreira, <clears throat> by our assistant engineer, Tom Bellinger, myself, and representatives of the county of Somerset, uh, the planning director, Walter Lane, and County Engineer Matt Loper. Um, it was explained to the, cap to the uh, state uh, how important the uh, Valley Road intersection at 206 is to our town. Um, and it also serves regional traffic uh, um, eastbound on Valley as well as southbound on 206 that wishes to make um, um, turns to go north and to also serve the uh, Green Village development. Mayor Thompson was emphatic uh, with DOT that uh, a jug handle or a spur connector, as DOT is calling it, is essential uh, for Hillsborough Township. Um, the uh, representatives of Somerset County uh, government uh, chimed in with the mayor, and it is for that reason that this resolution is before the board this evening uh, to be passed to the township committee, uh, to then be passed to the uh, Department of uh, Transportation in order to effectuate. Uh, these resolutions are specifically requested by DOT in order to move this project forward. 
I would add that Project 15N is not just the, the improvement at the Valley Road intersection with 206, but is the widening of Route 206 from the northern end of the where the bypass would be, where Old Somerville Road currently joins, uh, all the way up to, and by up I mean north, to Brown Avenue. So it would essentially connect the bypass with the already widened Route 206 in the area of the Duke Estate and would make sense of that as an entire uh, improved uh, uh, corridor or corridor of improved traffic. And uh, 15N has been on the DOT books, but like a lot of things, is unfunded by our broke New Jersey Transportation Fund right now. So um, it's this, I guess the DOT itself is requesting um, the township also emphasize the importance of it, I guess, to put this in queue. That is correct. Uh, at some point where money will become available, if and when. Any other uh, comments or questions by the board? Mr. Chairman, I would also point out that th this resolution directly affects uh, one of the applications that is on uh, today's agenda, which is a CRISMIC application. The applicant, in recognition of the fact that um, uh, the driveway proposed by him might directly in impact this intersection, has agreed to defer asking this board for any action uh, for a period of three months. Yes, and that's our, our next order of business will be to give that an uh, extension of time. <clears throat> okay, so um, right now though, is there a motion to uh, adopt this resolution, send it along to uh, the township committee? I'll move. Second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Julian? Yes. Mr. Peason? Yes. Mr. Mufani? Yes. Vice Chairman Cohen? Yes. Deputy Mayor Rochette? Yes. Chairman Dr. Cerisi? Yes. Uh, okay, so next up is the item of business, Chrismic Associates, uh, file 14, PB 21 MSR. Um, that is going to be, uh, the request is for that, which was going to be our first public hearing to be adjourned to March 5th, 2015, without further notice. Um, for the reasons that uh, our planner stated. So therefore, at this point, we need as an item of business to grant an extension of the application through March 31st, 2015. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Julian? Yes. Mr. Peason? Yes. Mr. Lafani? Yes. Vice Chairman Cohen? Yes. Deputy Mayor Burchette? Yes. Chairman Dr. Cerisi? Yes. Um, Having already announced the adjournment of the Chrismic Associates application to March 5th without further notice, uh, there are just two public hearings left on the agenda, RB Manufacturing, co-part of Connecticut, Inc. Um, is there any business from the floor for items not relating to those two public hearings? No, you're here for one of the public hearings. So... Um, no, it's if it's in relation to the copart hearing, you are again, as I said the last time you were here, out of order by asking that now. This has to do only with things that are not copart and not RB manufacturing. And I'm saying I have a question that is not related. Then come to the microphone. Maria Januszczyk, property owner uh, on Camplain Road in Hillsboro. Um, what I wanted to ask the board is who is the uh, liaison from the, uh, between the planning board and uh, the Envi Hillsboro's Environmental Commission? That would be me. Mr. Julian. Mr. Julian. Yeah. Um, who, who grants um, environmental uh, impact statement waivers? Who grants them? Yes. Well, as far as I understand, I mean the the board, the board, the board does. Hillsborough Planning Board grants yes. grants the, the waivers. Any planning board. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Note the record, Mr. Merdinger. Oh uh, yes, for the record, Mr. Merdinger has arrived. I'm here. Yes, you are. <laughs> Good evening, uh, William Trethway, 1274 uh, Millstone River Road here in Hillsboro. Uh, last week, we had the 
discussions on the area that was in need of rehabilitation or redevelopment. Just speaking to me. And the pardon? Is this better? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, I must have written it down wrong. I feel like a real dummy, but I couldn't find the public notice anywhere. Could you possibly tell me where that was notified, what paper, and when? Because I went through all the papers and I couldn't find it looking around the dates when we said last week. I may have written them down wrong. I don't have them in front of me, but I believe it was, and I don't quote me, I believe it was the Beacon and the Courier. Beacon and Courier? But don't quote me. Okay. Uh, how can I find out where that was? I Ask mean, the township clerk. Okay, thank you very much. And I also am a little concerned. Is that the, was that the hearing that uh, is talked about in the local redevelopment housing law that took place last week for when an area gets referred for, from the township, <coughs> from the council? I believe you know the answer you asked the question last week. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of curious why it was on the agenda last week again as a presentation, not as a hearing. And uh, I would, you know, you, you adopted the resolution, which you are supposed to do. And I think that's fine. And I'm all for COA and uh, doing things, but I'm also for due process and open and transparent government. And this. <laughs> Just want to say again, looks like it wasn't, and I will try to find the. Uh, that's thing, but probably. I cannot find it anywhere. In the <clears throat> that's papers. probably enough grandstanding on that. Thank you. Is that something that even requires that, uh, Eric? I don't know. You'd have to. I was, you're not going to comment on that. This was all discussed last week's meeting. Oh, okay. I wasn't here last week, so okay. So it's just a repetition. All right, good. Then it really is grandstanding. Uh, first public hearing, RB Manufacturing, LLC, file 14 PB 17 MSR, block 201, lot 11, 799 U.S. Highway, Route 206, applicant seeking revision to condition number two of resolution of approval as adopted 11 13 14 for property in the Light Industrial District. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Schiller. I'm, mm -hmm. Schiller. I'm an attorney at the uh, law firm of KNL Gates. Um, as indicated, uh, we're here today to uh, seek a, a slight amendment to uh, the resolution of approval uh, in connection with the minor site plan approval that was granted on October 2nd in connection with RB Manufacturing LLC's facility. Uh, by way of uh, recollection, uh, the approval was for a new rail switch, 357 linear feet of track, and to install a 35,000 gallon tank on site for the purpose of storing mineral oil by rail delivery in lieu of truck deliveries that currently occur on site. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, resolution of approval was approved uh, last November by the board, I believe on, at its November 13th meeting, and subsequent to uh, the approval, our uh, engineer has uh, reviewed it and has some comments and believes that it requires modification. I have. Uh, Robert Heibel from Van Cleef Engineering, who is going to describe the need for the uh, or a request for the amendment to this uh, resolution. Do you tell the truth, the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, the I do. After the uh, resolution was memorialized on the 13th of November, um, I got a copy of it, um, and I realized that one of the conditions within the resolution, uh, there wasn't a clear understanding of my client. So he did not discuss that with the board. Uh, one of the conditions has to do with the, uh, with the installation of the tank. And there's actually two items that uh, a spill prevention control and countermeasures plan that needs to be submitted to NJDOT with a copy to the township. And then there's actually a NJDEP air permit for the tank that needs to be submitted to the tank, uh, to the township as a copy uh, copy submitted to NJDEP and then ultimately approved by NJDEP. The way the condition reads right now in the resolution, uh, I can't provide an affidavit of compliance to the township until those items take place. Um, it was really the intent of the applicant to put the rail in at this point in time and prior to uh, that point he would put the foundation for the tank in but not get a building permit for the construction of the tank. Uh, so the applicant, uh, I provided to both uh, Mr. Idell and Mr. Bernstein's office copy of slightly revised 
language for condition number two, which would allow the application to go forth and and actually construct the rail at, the, at well, as soon as I do an affidavit of compliance. That's the whole matter. Bob, just for yeah. uh, clarification purposes, like the SPCC is um, is a federal regulation, so you said DOT, so I think I'm it's sorry. EPA. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct, just for the record. No. Okay, and any, any other, um, Neil? No, I know, um, I mean, in these resolutions, we took a look at it, and yeah, it's, it, we're just asking you to comply with the regulations. Nothing that, it's nothing that Hillsborough, it's not Hillsborough's regulations, it's the federal regulations or the state regulations. Right, it so, may take DEP three or four months yeah. to issue the permit for the, uh, for the tank, and the applicant would wait until that point in time to seek a building permit, but in the interim wants to go ahead and construct the rail. Yeah, we just asked you comply with the regs right. when appropriate. Yes. Mike? Any? Oh, no. no, okay. Totally logical. Uh, actually, Bruce? Uh, this matter has been discussed with the applicant. Uh, Mr. Julian was included in the conversation, so he is extremely familiar with the, uh, the requirements, um, and the, the staff has no objection to the request being made. Okay. Do you have any? Yeah. No, no. The language proposed is acceptable. Okay. Bill? Hmm? Any other board member? Question? Okay. All right, then. Uh, yes. Motion to open to uh, public. So moved. Thanks. All in favor say aye. 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 Any questions from the public for the applicant? Seeing none, motion to close public. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. It's a pleasure of the board. RB Manufacturing has been a great neighbor to uh, Hillsboro. I move that we uh, move the motion. Motion, the motion is to amend condition number two. Uh, the resolution would be on for the January 8th meeting, but the parties would be allowed to at least go forward and do the necessary actions. Okay, move that. What the counselor said, so move. Second? Second. Okay, roll call please. Mr. Julian? Yes. Mr. Berninger? I have to abstain because I wasn't here for the first meeting. Thank you. Mr. Pisan. Yes. Mr. Lapani. Yes. Vice Chairman Cohen. Yes. Deputy Mayor Burchett. Yes. Chairman Dr. Cerise. Yes. Oh, I abstain. Yeah, okay. Right All right. Here. Sorry. Abstain. All right. You very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. We'll be on the I don't remember. I'll get it to you before. We want to send it to you this time. I'll send it to the board. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for a short recess at this moment before Mr. Uh, Liebling starts. I want to check. I, Mr. Uh, Rydell, check something before we start five, the hearing. Ten. What do you need? Um, ten. Ten minute recess. Yeah, for you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're back from uh, recess. So. Copart of Connecticut uh, amended application file 14 PB 15 SR block 7301 lot 1 and block 71 lot 101 2124 Camplain Road and Camplain Sunnymead Road uh, applicants seeking amended major site plan approval from conditions of board resolutions 10 PB 13 SRV adopted 3311 and Board Resolution 11 PB 03 SR adopted 526 11 to revise the hours of operation and restrict the existing driveway exit to right turn only on property in the I 1 Light Industrial District. This was carried from November 13, 2014, without further notice. Counselor? Good evening. Charles Liebling of Wendell's Mark Slane and Mittendorf representing the applicant. Uh, we started at your October meeting, continued at your November meeting, and we're here um, this evening. Uh, just a reminder of the essence of the application. Uh, we're seeking to modify the hours of operation. At the weekday hours of operation remain unchanged. We're seeking the right to open on Saturday uh, when needed and Sundays following a state of emergency. And in connection with that, those expanded hours for Saturday and Sunday, we're proposing a series of mitigating measures uh, for the overall operation of the property that would obviously extend to weekdays as well. Uh, we heard the board loud and clear last month regarding your concerns as to two things in particular. 
the need for an app, the applicant to propose a system of controls that's reliable and verifiable, and the need for the applicant to propose operating parameters that it is confident can be met. Uh, we believe we've identified a way to address those issues that will permit the board to satisfy itself um, as, as to Copart's ability to do that and to approve this application. We submitted in advance of this hearing a letter um, uh, December 8th um, restating the description of the modifications being sought and the mitigating measures being proposed together with the enhanced types of, of controls that the board indicated it wanted to see. Um, I'd like to have that marked in this ex exhibit to be made part of the record. Do you have a copy? Um, okay, I can. I can you know what the exhibit number is? Pardon? What are we up to? What are we up to? Um, let's see. I think there was one. I think we can do A1 with tonight's. That, that works. Okay. We're going to mark okay. it A1, December 8th. Yes. Oh, you have, you're going to do a sticker. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hold on, counsel. Sure. Okay. Come on. Thank okay. You. Uh, you all know Mr. Hopkins. Um, also with us this evening is Phil Weber, a regional manager for uh, for this region for Copart, who I asked to attend in the hopes of being able to address and resolve any remaining issues. Um, what what I would propose, um, unless the board sees differently, would be to. Uh, go through the description of what is being proposed in terms of mitigating measures um, and answer the, any questions that the board has about them. Make Certainly. sense? Yes. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. All right. So I'm referring to the, the, the December 8th letter. Um, uh, first, extend the, that's, that's unchanged, 8 to 5, um, um, Monday through Saturday. That's, that's unchanged from the prior. The, the, the prior version of this application, I guess, is what I want to say. Um, uh, number two, uh, permit delivery of inventory. That's unchanged, except uh, Saturday is from 8 to 3 p.m. We had originally proposed 8 to 5 p.m. So that's a, a reduction based on a uh, proffer that we made at the, at the prior hearing. Uh, number three is the same. Uh, number four is new, and that's how we want to propose addressing the board's concerns about a state of emergency. It's kind of a three-part um, check system. First of all, there has to be a state of emergency. Second, um, there, for five, at least five consecutive days following the state of emergencies, drop-offs have to exceed 120 damaged vehicles. Right now, uh, there's approximately 80 processed per day, so we've got, there's got to be that 50% increase. And then you, we're, we're offering the limit, not more than four Sundays. Hopefully, that provides a verifiable and uh, controllable um, standard that, uh, that can be met. Um, with respect to the end of business hours, I'm, I'm moving on. That's unchanged. With respect to delivery of inventory, obviously, everyone was concerned about and we struggled with the idea of, <coughs> of uh, sub haulers showing up at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning with the combination to the gate and being able to drop off, drop off vehicles. Uh, what uh, the applicant is proposing is a time-locked gate that will essentially make entry impossible after that, after that time. We'll lock at 11 o'clock, somebody shows up, they're out of luck. Um, so that we think is a significant um, and verifiable means of, of keeping 11 o'clock a solid, firm deadline. Um, no more than 45 trucks are, a week. We ha before, we had suggested 35. We put 45 because we want to respond to the request that we be beyond sure that, that we weren't going we to violate um, these restrictions. So, we've added some additional padding. We thought 35 was enough, but this should certainly avoid any violations. Similarly, C, it, before it said 90, now we're saying uh, 100 for, for exactly the same reason. What this also does, it gives a little more cushion for the issue of, um, well, what happens if during the week um, there's, there's a, an unexpected influx? And what that would do, it will allow 
um, it will allow the applicant to lock the gate at 5 o'clock. I'm on, I'm on to D here. Um, so that if these limits have been met earlier in the week, nobody, nobody can get in that evening or any successive evenings during the week. We don't expect that to happen, but there's a, a control in place. Um, similarly, and, okay, and I'm, I'm, skipping, I'm skipping on here. Oh, well, let me just go through these. So maximum size truck carrier is, is still four. Video monitoring still the same. Um, video log and drop-off log still the same. For H, we had suggested um, that a certification of counts be provided to the township. We had said monthly. The board had said weekly. At this point, we don't believe that, that it will be necessary. We believe that there, it's basically busy work of certifying counts and then no one looking at them since we have the time-locked um, gate. <coughs> So we would propose that that just be done if, on request if there's some concern that these criteria aren't being met. Um, I, I and J, these, these work together with the time-locked gate um, and, the, and the limits. If, if, if the limit has been reached um, on, a given, on a given day, sub-haulers will be contacted um, not to not to show up because the gate's going to be locked uh, at 5 o'clock um, as of for, for that day and, and they won't be able to get in. Um, nothing else has changed um, until we get to number 11 where we're providing um, specifics about the um, dust management um, research uh, Copart carried out some, some research in this intervening month and uh, made the determination that um, this, was, this was the correct size pump and sprayer for the, for, the, um, for the buffer area and that wind speeds is what, is what causes the, um, the dust to rise and they will have an actual um, technology in place to determine um, when the wind speed is adequate to, uh, to to risk a dust problem, and and they'll spray um, in that in that instance, and then finally also to keep speeds down within that that area. Um, so we're hoping that that those provide an, an adequate series of of verifiable measures um, that will permit uh, this board to to permit the uh, the occasional Saturday and the emergency-based Sunday openings. Aside from prevent, presenting this to the board, did you have any other uh, witnesses to present the testimony? Y yes, we have our site engineer because there were a couple of items related to the site that, the site plan itself, that were, that were being altered, um, turning in, turning out, um, which are, are in the application. I can I can have them presented to the yes. board. Yes. Why, why don't you do that? Okay. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Fano. Okay. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. State your full name, spelling, or just state your full name. It's Carl Alfaro. Thank you. Okay. Could you please um, identify the firm you're with and, and your sure, professional I'm with credentials? Sure. Van Cleef Engineering. Uh, I've been a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey since 2003. You've appeared before this board? I have. Okay, been accepted? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, profit thank, you. okay thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, if you could, um, referring to the exhibits that we have, identify the site plan changes that need, are being proposed. He's going to need your mic. Here you go. If he's going to go over there and put that over. Yeah. Uh, the improvements to the frontage of the site take place along Campaign Road. Excuse me, could you identify the uh, exhibit number? Okay. It's exhibit A1. Okay. Um, what Coparts is proposing to do is to install uh, three no parking or idling signs along the frontage of Campaign Road. Also, uh, we are adding an additional two no idling signs along the front of Camp Lane Road, similar to what 
is along the lot frontage of over here on this lot. That is extra. Uh, I provided that plan to Mr. White's office. Um, also, uh, two truck entrance only signs are going to be located at the western entrance, and this is to um, keep the truck flow traffic to this entrance only. Um, <coughs> they also want to install a no left turn sign at this ent entrance and exit for the trucks, and they also want to have a uh, <coughs> proposed turning arrow. Uh, for right turns only coming out of the site for trucks. They want to add two new tr no truck signs at this um, eastern entrance, and this will be for only car traffic. Uh, they would like to install privacy slats along, along the, uh, in the fences along the front. Um, they also are going to replace any pine trees that have been damaged and are dying again along the frontage. And they are proposing to install a river jack stone um, area right here across the street from the entrance of the facility to mitigate for trucks that have gone over that area and created ruts. The river jack stone will help support the point load of the truck, spread it out a little bit. Excuse me, Mr. Sherman. Could you identify the block and lot that you're referring to? I know it is Mr. Sopko's property. I think it is lot. Ten or eleven. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And that is the uh the improvements for the for the site plan. Um Thank you. Bill, any questions? No comments. No comments. How, how, much, um, how much of the parking area or the, the interior area is covered by asphalt at this point? I remember like we went through a process. Some was we were going to increase the asphalt, but do you know as of like today how much is covered by it and how much is gravel? N none, of the, none of the area where they store the cars is, is asphalt. It's um, recycled concrete and or a mix of soil, dirt. Oh, I thought part of it was like I think the, I think the definitely the entrance over here is macadam. Okay. Staging area. But the other side was all. And this this side is uh, is um, asphalt also. Okay. That's it's paved. That's just rock. It's just rock. rock. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant to say I meant to say stone. The stone stone staging area. In the parking at parking lot is McCabe. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Uh, yeah, based on the um, River Jack stone on the property across the street, is that under the assumption that trucks will still be possibly rolling on that property? It is possible. I, I will tell you that I've run the turning templates for the site, and the trucks can make the maneuver. The reason why they're rutting up the property is probably because of careless driving. Any other? For the engineer? Okay. Um, so because we're scoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I need a motion again? Okay, again, motion to open public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 So, uh, questions for the engineer about what he has just presented? Yes. Come up. Yeah. Did you say you had a question? Susan Gullah, Ford Hunt Club Road. Um, this River Jack, is that going to be on private property, on somebody else's property? No, that will be located within the right of way. Okay. Um, last time I asked about, when they were talking about the resolution, yeah. someone testified that they would be making improvements that, because you were referring to repeated damage to the properties across the road. Is this what they were talking about? Yes, the, 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 um, the neighbor's driveway. 
the encroaches, it connects to the road which lies in the right of way. The area that's being disturbed happens to lie within the right of way in front of the neighbor's property. Okay, so this is the, when they said our engineer has done something to help with the repeated damage, this that's, is it? That's it, yes. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions for the engineer? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other testimony to present? No, we don't. Now, I, I take it that the regional manager would be available to answer questions about the other part of what you presented today, which is the perhaps we should swear him in now uh, so that he can answer those questions. Sure. You should tell the truth, the whole truth, and the, the truth. Sir. I do. Thank you. State your full name, spelling your last name. Philip Weber, W E B E R. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll take questions from the board first on the, um, the proposed new conditions of operation that uh, were listed in the letter and then enumerated just earlier by council. I just have one. Um, the attorney read the entire letter. I'd like to have that confirmed by the applicant because we know about attorneys. Well, no, no, I understand he read it. I, I guess I thought that the submission of this and its presentation as, as an exhibit, A1, made it officially part of the record, or? It made it part of the record. If the board would like the applicant's representatives to confirm that, I yes. don't yeah. see a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I confirm it, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, That's better. With regards to the, the gate and the, and the uh, locking, um, is it a self-closing gate or is it ability for it to be propped open at any point? It's, it's not a, it's not a self-closing gate, but it will, I don't know all the specifics on it. Our security um, manager, so security director has the specs on it, but the gate will, it, it will be wired. It's, um, it will shut it down and it will make the gate immovable once the system shuts the shuts it down at 11 o'clock I understand that but that only works if the gates closed so my, my question is if someone be say to come in at 11 o'clock as a last truck in and the gate is open and they do not close the gate therefore then another truck could get in at any time so what's preventing or to make sure that that gate is closed uh, as it should be and locked with the timestamp block. I, I want to correct myself. Ken knew the specifics more in talking with our um, security. It will, be a motorized, it will be motorized, so it will close. I'm sorry. So you're putting a new gate in? We do put in a new gate in. You could, you've, you've already been sworn in, right? So you could speak, mm -hmm. so you could speak out loud. No, you, you were last time, so you remain under oath, you correct, Counselor? Yes. 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 So they can, they can use the they can use the use use the uh, go ahead state state it directly. It'll be a it'll be the same gate that's existing, but it just will be a motor attached to it. Cool. As soon as all this is going to take place, the motorized the signs, the time line. Sorry. Uh, how soon is all this going to be taking place? Is there a time stamp on this? Do we have a right to ask for a time stamp, Eric? Are we asking for a time stamp? Are you asking when this is going to be put into effect? Yeah, well, when is it, yeah, how much time are we giving them before this is all going to take effect? Well, I, I, I think the question that the applicant should consider is, if you recall the last hearing, there was significant concern raised by both the board and by members of the public that the applicant was currently not conforming with the resolution of the board. Forget an amended resolution. So what actions has the applicant taken to conform to the current conditions established in the resolution? Just, if I can just, just clarify for my client, you mean after 11, drop offs after 11? Drop off after 11 and all of the other conditions that are in the current resolution regarding no cars after 11, no stuff after, on Saturday, no stuff on Sunday, all of the items that I believe the board and I believe at least several members of the public all of whom I believe are here, and we'll probably ask again, or request, what has happened since November 13th to conform to the current resolution? That's part one. 
Then part two is assuming for the sake of the discussion that the board were to grant the requests of the applicant, how quickly is the applicant going to conform to this set of conditions? And can we also hold their feet to the fire somewhat in doing a, sur a surety bond, you know, a performance bond, uh, if they don't do it within a certain period of time? A reasonable. I'm not talking about a couple of days, but a reasonable period of time, a performance bond that they, that's money. Well, can the bond, you, board you want, you're going to want money. Bond isn't going to do you any good. And then the question is, what are you looking to, why, why don't we take these one at a time? When we take issue one, what has the applicant done between November 13th and tonight to conform to the current resolution? Okay. Um, I, one thing is for violations that have occurred, um, they have been addressed locally with the drivers, the sub haulers. When we found them to be violating the procedures, we've threatened the, the people at the time with uh, termination of their services with our with our company um, with regards to Saturday hours in terms of us working or Sunday hours um, we have not um, going back through our records when we look at it since uh, Hurricane Sandy our operation after Hurricane Sandy ended the only time we've we've been we've had to work on a Saturday at the Hillsborough facility I, uh, has just been a few times and that's for biannual inventories that we have to conduct to our to our facility, and we have not worked any Sundays, um, so that's what we've done internally. And then, right. as I said, we we've, we've addressed um, our drivers as as we have found them, and as we've observed our records. Has anyone been terminated for violating any of the conditions, either of township ordinance or this resolution, since November thirteenth? No. Part number two. <coughs> What timeline is the applicant proposing to, ins to meet the conditions that they are proposing to meet vis-a-vis -vis the operation of the gate and conformance with all of the other items? It would be difficult to give that answer right away, but I could get that information. What it would require, obviously, is once we had the approval from the board, I'd be able to go um, in terms of acquiring the signage, um, you know, the, time, the timeline to get that installed. I'll be getting with our director of security right away to um, to get the specs on the system measured for the gate system and to put that in place. And I'd be able to give that timeline back to the back to the board. And the third question, and I'm suggested you speak to council before you answer this, is whether or not the applicant will provide a cash bond of some amount to be determined either as a, well, my word, fine or some kind of mitigation money to address any violations of either this resolution currently or a future resolution as requested. And I would suggest that before you answer that, you speak to Mr. Liebling. Yeah, let, let, you me, let me speak to Mr. Bernstein Eric, first. For just a just second, just, and, and I could add a little codicil to that. I have no problem with Bruce being the arbiter of if they're moving fast enough. Well, I, I think before you even get to that, that's, well, I mean, I'm, that, but that's I'm a decision. Saying, that's a decision the board has to. to dis well, I appreciate the, board the nebulousness, nebulousness <laughs> of the, the fact that they don't know anything right now, but they will afterwards. So I, I, I would, Bruce I would, could I would, be. I would frankly, and, and with all due respect to Bruce, if the board is interested in granting these conditions, that you establish a time frame. Because without a time frame, with all due respect to Bruce, I don't think Bruce is going to want to be the arbiter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure Bruce has the authority to be the arbiter. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I, have a, I had a different approach. Um, the granting of the new hours of operations, can it not be made contingent on the applicant's performance of all the other commitments in the resolution. Oh, we would absolutely agree to that. So I, I assume that, that was part and parcel. So that yeah. they don't get any new hours of operation until a township official yeah. certifies that all the other things I'm are okay done. with that. Guys. Yes. I'm good with that. That's even better. I, I We're not talking about a whole lot. We're talking about motorizing a gate. Sure. We're putting up some damn signs. Yeah. So let's be bold. Let's say, wow, we can do that in two months. So let's just do it, all right? We'll also get the We're word talking out. 15 minutes around this crap. Let's just get, put two months out there or something. Jesus let's get this Greg, done. Will you relax? Come on. We, you know what? There's a, it, we have people in the audience. They have issues. We want to go through it. We want to work it out. We're not going to run through this. 
No, I think he's indicating it t the time frame for getting it done. I understand, but there's a is it also a, in terms of that. There's also the alerting to the noticing all the drivers and make sure that they're either not only vocally no, uh, noticed but written notice certified that they know that they got the notice and you know that they got the notice. So if they complain, I, th I think I think part of the problem with that, Mr. Cohen, with all due respect is this has been an ongoing issue for a period of time. The applicant's been aware now for nay two months at least because they were here for the first, my word, beating in October. They came back for the second one in November. That was worse. Which was worse than the first one. Just to keep around. Just to make sure that everybody's here. So I don't know how much time we need to advise their contractors that parking on the street is against the law that idling on the street is against the law, that entering the facility after hours is against the rules, all the other things. At some point, if the board is desirous of granting this, there needs to be an overall time frame sooner than later because there's a significant problem in the initial um, <coughs> confirmation <coughs> slash compliance. No. Can I make a proposal in that regard? We would propose one month to for notices, et cetera, um, and 90 days to complete the balance in terms of getting the, the gate dealt with because there are specs and ordering needs. 90 days starting when? 90 days from approval. And cool. and we won't we won't op we don't have the right to Saturday and Sunday operation Perfect. until that the gate is dealt with as an additional stick. Assuming, assuming the board grants either. Okay. You, you did propose, Mr. Chairman. You also didn't say anything about what his uh, his uh, bond were, what he, the monies he would leave. Well, he I, think, I, think, I think Mr. Liebling is going to want to talk to his client in the <laughs> before I thought he, the chairman's proposal was in lieu of that, that you know, I, I, you know, I think that the point, the point is that um, you don't want to grant new privileges until all new obligations are met. What's and, more important to them? Right. No, of course. I mean, I'm not, I'm not objecting to what you said, Steve. I, I you know, no, it could like be, it could, better. no, it could be belt and suspenders too for all you, for, you know, you could do both. I'm just saying that one thing that made eminent sense to me is that no privileges before responsibilities are met. That's all. And we, we agree um, with that. Yeah. You know, it just made sense to me regardless of any other consideration. That's all. But we have a proposal from the applicant and uh, we can consider that as we, we wish. I'd also like to uh, just chime in with the dust control. I mean, the, the 90 days is, is good, but 90 days of dust control in February, March is different than dust control in, you know, springtime where it's, you know, you're going to have dust. So, I mean, in order to be, I've heard it again and again and again from a lot of the neighbors that, you know, the dust issues just keep, keep coming back and back. So if there's any way to um, kind of administer that, well, one option is to extend the time frame for the change of the hours until we're satisfied that that's being addressed. Yeah. Well, How that's... How are we going to determine that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How that's one I of the... In the, one in the thing, one of the um, dust, control dust control is mentioned mm -hmm. as one of the obligations. So, uh, again, if, the, if the, the stipulation is that all the obligations have to be met before the hours, <laughs> the change in hours takes effect, that's one of them. We, so. we will have this, the, the proposed dust control system and anemometer in, in place at the same time as we have the gate in place with the same restriction of that we can't, uh, we can't use the increased operating hours until then. And fortunately, it coincides with a less dusty time of year. Well, it is the winter. Yeah. But wet and snowy and whatever. So. I just want to make sure it works. Yeah. No, the, the, right, that those 90 days <laughs> yeah. don't get extra. Right. They take place now. Okay. Um, I my 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 consideration, and I remember bringing this up last time, is with the concept of the state of emergency, which is declared for every time there's two inches or more of snow. So, um, uh, to me, uh, I get the state of emergency for things like Sandy and Irene, 
um, but I, I'm not sure that uh, that that isn't too per permissive a standard when states of emergency are declared just to liberate funds for snow plowing uh, multiple times per winter. For those of you who remember, the governor declared a state of emergency the day before thanks uh, before yes. Thanksgiving. Yes. But for traffic, for that was a state of emergency was declared for that snowstorm. Oh, that's that snowstorm. Yeah, it all went storm to work. that had no that had no, uh, no accumulation. Some, yeah, no, that some did. There was some accumulation. Did. Okay. Because the applicant, stop me if I'm wrong, Mr. Leland, the applicant is asking for a state of emergency anywhere in the 21 counties of the state of New Jersey. That has to be coupled with an increase for five consecutive days of 50 percent above above their normal above their normal um, load, which which is not going to happen from a traffic mm -hmm. state of emergency. Well, except we're back, we're, here, here's, we're back to the same problem, and I assume we're going to hear this from the public in a couple of minutes. Where's the proof that we're going to be able to know that there's been a 50 percent increase in volume at your place if we don't know what the baseline volume is? Well, no, we gave you a number. We gave you a number. We gave you 120 numbers. Okay. You so. gave us 120, which means we have to figure out whether or not we've had more than 120 damaged cars in five consecutive right. we, days. We, we keep these records. The applicant keeps these records. And I think the board suggested a weekly notification, and you thought about it, and the response back to a weekly notification was, we'll give you records when... Well, that, and if we asked for it. That was not related to the state of emergency. Well, I, th I think it's interrelated with all of it. When, when you ask mm -hmm. the municipality or the, and, this, and this board to grant conditions based on a target that has to be validated, there's a need to validate it. And simply saying, as long as we get at least 120 cars per day, for five days prior, that should give us the state of emergency operations on Sunday without anybody here being able, because I would suspect, stop me, I'm wrong, that there's a group of people behind you who are not going to simply say, oh, that's nice, I guess we have a state of emergency. They're going to ask the township, how do we know that they have met this condition, assuming this condition is granted? So we're back to the... Okay, well, let me check. This is a rare occurrence, so let me... Well, but... Let, it, let, me, it, let me just put the wrong for my... State of emergencies are not rare occurrences. No, I know they're not rare occurrences. But having five like days in a row storm. of 120 cars is a rare occurrence. Uh, again, a state of emergency for Thanksgiving traffic does not Right, but the, the yes, I, I get that. But the five days, the, the point that uh, our council is making is that, that the counts, counting becomes right, a responsibility of the township. And um, there could be other ways to deal with this. I mean, there is a difference between uh, the uh, the routine, this routine snowstorm state of emergency and a true emergency. Well, I'm not so sure, and Mr. Chairman, the number is not more viable than that one. It's back to how do we know mm -hmm. when somebody calls the administrator's office and says, oh, Copart's open on Sunday, Mr. Ferrara is going to want to know how he determines whether or not they should be open on Sunday. So we're back to the issue of, based on their proposal, the necessity for reports. Shouldn't we have a notification to the administrator? Well, not even a notification. We need the records. Yeah, the records and a notification. Okay. This, has happened, this has happened twice since this uh, open, is open. We will gladly provide the <coughs> township clerk or Mr. Rydell or township administrator, whoever you designate, with evidence of this increased inflow prior to a Sunday opening. Now, let me ask another question, plain lawyer. It appears, according to your proposal, that in order to start the Sunday open, you have to have 120 damaged vehicles for five consecutive days. In the same breath, you're asking for no more than four consecutive Sundays related to a specific state of emergency. At what point do we no longer have to have the 120 vehicles per day in order to maintain an opening on a Sunday. And before you answer, let me explain what I mean. If this week was magic week, state of emergency, 120 vehicles, you open Sunday. Mm -hmm. Next week, you go back to 80. 
Are we going to be open on Sunday because you had a state of emergency declared with 120 vehicles for five days? If they need to for the for the 120 that arrived earlier, but we're trying what by putting this cap of four, we're trying to avoid that and saying four, four is the max. We'll let the public have a moment. Yeah, I'm just saying that the way that it happens during the winter, there will always be another four weeks. Yeah, or, or any other. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, 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 hold on. I, I don't think you're getting it. There have been two state of emergencies. And so it's not, obviously not every time the governor has one for this or that. So we can look at this historic, this is not a, a ploy to get to be open on Sundays. Right. So let's, let, let's just... Yeah, I just, I, I just want to explain how our business works. I explained it the last time. We went through last winter. We came, we've had two catastrophic events that happened uh, her, the week after Hurricane Irene when the, the water levels increased and Sandy. Last year was probably, as we all lived through it, probably one of the rougher w winters. We saw our volume significantly increase, okay? We did, not, we did not operate on Saturdays. We did not operate on Sundays. That's not a catastrophic event. A catastrophic event is the state declares it. The insurance companies are in full mode. The reason why it goes out to 21 counties is that's our area of coverage. For, for instance, an example would be this past spring in YMS in Pennsylvania, there was a hailstorm. The governor declared a state of emergency. At that point, we, we were, ended up being mobilized, and for about six weeks, we were operating. And that's, that's not, here. not here. That was in Pennsylvania. But the other, the other thing around the Sundays is the reason is when those cars come in, we have services we need to perform for those, for our customers, the insurance companies, to process those cars, not just physically, but the paperwork that goes in behind it. The insurance companies are trying to get, take care of their customers as quickly as possible, and that's what drives it. As soon as we get the backlog done, we, we shut down. And that's why I go back to, since the CATS, we have, not, we have not operated on a Saturday outside of the inventory, and we have not operated on Sunday. And that was going through last, window, when the, last winter when our volume had increased by about 15 to 18 percent over the normal yearly volume. Okay, so let me, the fact that you didn't operate on Saturday or Sunday shouldn't be a surprise because you're not allowed to. The question is, <laughs> did you get to 120 cars for five consecutive days during last winter? No. Okay, that's, no. that's the, All right. that's but, the but, fact. But, so, so, but let me ask a follow-up question unrelated, related and unrelated. What's more important for Sunday opening? Processing the cars by bringing them in or processing the cars by doing the paperwork which allows your people to come on the trucks and no more vehicles? They're, they're both equally important. They can both be equally important. Okay. It de depends on what stage of the event we're in. Appreciate the answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, I have one. Yes. Um, the time locked gate that uh, will be installed cannot be opened by sub haulers after 11, but before you have the gates will be closed halfway to allow vehicles to exit. Once the vehicles exit, is the motor magically shut? That's at 5 o'clock. Okay. Yeah, I know. That's at 5 o'clock. Then after 11, um, how locked down is that gate? And <coughs> if the fire department needs to respond, what measures are in place for that? Um, if I may illustrate on the on Exhibit A, you might want to take the walking yeah, yeah, yeah. Our current gate here it will not be motorized; it'll be locked, and there will not, there will, no one will have access to that besides employees, management. That has a fire lock on it. That's the one that's always been there. We're, we're talking about this gate here. It will be motorized, um, and it will automatically close and open uh, with a pin pad, I believe, is the specs we're looking at, the keypad, sorry. So since it's going to be motorized, may I, su may, may I suggest that can we take out that halfway to allow people to get out and let it close, and then the people on the inside just have to press the button so they can get out? So we don't have to worry about 
as Mr. Yeah, Easton was talking, that we don't have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, that seems reasonable. I mean, seems like a little brainer there. Okay. Any Did other? That's asked by the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think so. So there's another gate that the fire department gets in with fire lock. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Questions for the public for these two witnesses? Starting in the back. Raise his hand first. Uh, Bill Trethaway, 1274 Millstone River Road in Hillsboro, New Jersey. Uh, there was, I'm not quite sure, what's the conditions when the gate gets locked at 5 o'clock and then no more drop-offs get done? What causes that to happen? What triggers it? What, what the applicant submitted was if the, if the caps on, the weekly caps are met before then, because they're, 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 we're, we're proposing caps on, on the number of vehicles that can be dropped off between 5 and 11. 45 trucks per week, 100 vehicles per week. If those, let's say Thursday night, Mike. we hit 45 trucks, it will be locked at 5 o'clock on Friday, so that 5 to 11 on Friday is not available for official drop offs. And if you hit it earlier in the week, it'll be locked at same, 5 same, those nights? Yeah, I picked that as an example. If it takes place on Friday, like you gave us the example, how you notify the drivers who are on their way to drop off cars that you hit the 45th truck? That's, that's mentioned in, in the information that we um, submitted. There, the, the facility is in constant contact with these sub haulers. They are, they are subcontractors to them and will be told the gate will be locked at 5, don't show up. How are you in contact with them? Because uh, something can be done while they're on the road or is it back through their dispatch or? Uh, we, we either see them in person because they're there every day and we have all contact phone numbers for them. But if they're on their way in on Friday and you've met your limit, you're not going to see them in person until they get there. So you can't tell them before they get there not to come by. We'll, we'll know exactly how many cars we're at the morning of, so there'll be plenty of time to notify the car, the sub haulers that day. Okay, you stated earlier, I think that your limit was going to be 35 trucks and you want to raise it to 45 to make sure you don't get a violation. How about controls instead? Would that be something you'd consider? One of the reasons why we increase the amount is because of the seasonal fluctuations that do ha occur with our business. For example, this time of year, it is going to go up in, in other parts of the season. It's going to go down. We wanted to put in the correct, a correct buffer so we didn't have to come back in the future. When you, the trucks do come into your facility and drop off the car, do you have anything to tell them not to idle their trucks when they're on your property, when they're sitting there? Do you have any signs or anything? Are you referring to normal daylight hours or are you referring any hours? To well, yeah, there is there is signage that uh, there's no idling in place, but th these are these are um, these trucks require an idle speed in order to operate the bed of the truck, so there is idling taking place. Well, while, while they're doing that, but if they're waiting their turn to drop off a car or something, do you have anything to tell them not to idle? Are there signs saying yes. that in accordance with the DEP? There is. Okay. Um, what happens when you get, don't happen to notify a driver and he comes by and the gate's locked at 5 o'clock because your positive control is to lock the gates we can't get in? Does he stop on the street and park and try to call somebody or will you be willing to put something into your, into your thing here where you say that you will sign a contract with them that they can't, if they come by and the gate's locked, that they must immediately move on? I mean, I... I mean, these are the concerns that have been raised that people are concerned that the right. trucks come by and they sit there and wait. And you're, I think I, I heard your attorney say, and I think I heard your, opera, your operations manager say he agrees to the attorney, that you're taking controls that you're sure will satisfy everything, but I think you've got to make sure these controls satisfy the planning board, not just you. We're, we're attempting to do that. We're attempting to do that. Um, we, when, when we dispatch out our 
our vehicles, as Ken mentioned, we pretty much know what we know what we've dispatched all week. We know what we've brought in every day as we've tracked it. If we've hit that limit, either two things are going to happen. We're not going to dispatch that amount of trucks to go out to, um, to pick up cars because we can't bring them back in. If one got away from us, we will contact them not to come in. And if somebody did violate that, we will address it immediately and to the point of um, possible termination with the, with the sub hauler to, to no longer um, can no longer work for us. I guess my question is, if you can't get a hold of them and they end up showing up, what sort of controls are you going to have to prevent them sitting there and going, the gate's locked, what am I going to do? The testimony was that the gate locking at 5 o'clock was your positive control to make sure no trucks came by, that no trucks dropped off cars. I'm trying to find out if you have a positive control to make sure that no trucks come by in that case at all. Well, we're, we're, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. We will have no, no parking, no idling. So, um, we will have signage in the front that they're not to be there, and hopefully law enforcement would tell them that. Outside of that, again, we're going through specific guidelines. We have specific requirements with our, with our carriers to perform to our standards. If they're not, again, I will go back to say we will address it with those individually, individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's hard to anticipate every little scenario, but if somebody violates it at that point after we've taken, we've taken in uh, consideration, we've, we've spelled it out for them, we put the locks in place and we have the signage and they continue to violate that, either two things are going to happen. We'll discontinue our service with them or they'll possibly get a ticket from the police who are, could possibly be in that situation because they should, they're, they're somewhere where they shouldn't be. Perhaps it would be useful to have the engineer again point out, as he did earlier during his testimony, what signage was going, going to go where. Mr. Weber, can I ask a real question while he's in? Sure. Are the people who are delivering your, your subcontractors, are you dispatching them out to bring, are they just rogue vendors just going to show up with a car like because they say, hey, I got a car, I'm going to bring it to you? No. So no. essentially you know what's coming in before they come? Yes. So uh, the chances of a guy just showing up out of nowhere with a car that you had no idea was coming is pretty much remote or impossible. It's, it's, it's yes, okay. yes, we, we schedule everything. It's, so not essentially you have dispatched out 11 cars to be picked up that day. You know the 11 carriers who you supposedly are expecting that day to come in with cars. Yes. But this question comes based upon testimony at the last hearing where they said that did happen. So I have no more questions, thank you. However, uh, sir, if I have the engineer point out the signage yeah. again for everyone. Sure. Mm -hmm. Again, regarding idling, there'll be five signs. There'll be uh, three no parking or idling signs. One will be here, one will be here, one will be here. And then additionally, there'll be two more no idling zones. Uh, I believe one here, and I believe one here. <coughs> So five, is, five is there one. room on that on that uh, easement or not easement in the, along that road to park a truck? There's no parking uh, on that road. Uh, well, is there room to pull a truck off to park a truck? Legally or <laughs> physically? Just physically, answer the question. Physically, half, half probably half on the road, half off the road. Okay, so it'll be in the road. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be in the, road. the police will take care of it. Yes. Right. So. We can have all if the idling called, signs that we want. We can have all the no parking signs we want, but the police are going to tell them to get move on. So. Right. So if right. So even without a um, a no idling sign, there is a ticket for obstruction of the roadway. Huh? We still want them, oh, still still want want them yes. though, of course. But the, there is still that. So uh, simply having the police come by. Right. Okay. Gotcha. But thank you for pointing out the signage. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Yes, if I may. Uh, we, we've heard a lot of conversation about these sub haulers. Do we have any idea how many there are that they contract with? We, we currently have 12 contracted companies. The number of employees uh, that they employ is unknown. Would the applicant be willing to provide the township with a list of all current sub haulers? And any changes in sub haulers? There's a lot of turnover in that industry. Well, except you guys are the controlling who's getting turned over, so my point. Not necessarily. 
would the purpose be? For example, if an individual, the police come by and we want to know whether or not it's your sub hauler or whether or not it's somebody who happens to be driving by who has a car who may not have been called because the issue of how they got there and where is different. If you're in control of who shows up versus them simply showing up. And there's been testimony on both. So the answer as to why I'm suggesting that is because when, if the police go out and find the truck out there and the gentleman who's dri or the person who's driving it can't answer a simple question, we're, we're aware of who the sub haulers are and we're aware of who aren't. Are you even suggesting that the law enforcement treat these individuals different? No, we're suggesting that when you come to us and say that we control our sub haulers and we find that over a period of time the people who find themselves sitting outside your facility after hours and after you've locked the gate are all your sub haulers, it's a very different situation relative to you than it is the occasional periodic visit by an individual you have no control over. And I guarantee you, Mr. Liebling will tell you what the difference is. <laughs> you appreciate the distinction he's drawing? I we can we can keep you we can give you an update. Who do we this send it to? Yeah. We'll we'll figure well, that law enforcement. We'll we'll figure that we'll part us. out. We'll work that part out. You're willing to do it. My my only concern is that there's that there's there's no. Um, we're not treating folks differently. Um, just because they are under our employee. I don't think he's proposing. We're not proposing different treatment. You're going to get treated differently. You're going to get treated. That's exactly right. You're going to get treated differently because you've testified before this board on more than one occasion that you control who comes to your facility and who doesn't. And if it turns out that over a period of time the people who are still in violation of this agreement, assuming the board approves it, are your sub haulers, life is very different. You get it. That's the, the distinction in, in, in treatment. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions for these two witnesses? Yes. What? I still. I thought you be what you want to do. My name again, Maria Janusik, two one five five Camp Lane Road, property owner. Uh, can someone show me where block 73.01 lot 1 is on on the uh, Didn't we just answer, we answered that question last plans? time we were here, didn't we? We answered that question last time we were here. Why no, are you repeating I'm, the question again? No, I'm asking to see that that property. Because last, last, last time, last time there was a, a one spot in the middle, now it's but, all but either covered, Mr. Alfano so or Mr. White yeah. address the issues. Of I believe you said block 73.01, lot one? Yes. This one. Uh, so what are the other gray areas This is the, This is the entire lot. That is all block 73.01? Correct. Well, according to the uh, tax map, there are four different right lots there. Check right now. It is irrelevant. To this, to this application. Yeah, it went through this the last time. We, we did. Uh, Councillor, uh, would you, because uh, I don't want to. Good night. Okay. Janice, uh, the issue of how the a, a tax map may show a block and lot versus what is before the board, the official block and lot for purposes of board consideration is what is on the maps before the board. If Ms. Blaney's office has a different map, or there is an older map that shows a different block and lot. We have the testimony of the applicant's engineer, and I believe the testimony, I won't say testimony, the concurrence of the board's engineer, that what Mr. Alfano has shown is block 73.01, lot 1. Is that correct, Mr. White? Correct. Okay, so according to the application, that uh, is 15.6837 acres. Again, the issue is, because, is relevance. Because uh, we, I've been told several times that uh, there was a merging of several lots. 
when were those lots merged and which lots were they? It's not relevant to this application. It is relevant because, because one of the lots was zoned residential. So how could that be merged with industrial lots? Mr. Chairman. We went yes. through this at the last meeting. There is one lot, and I have a copy of it, owned by Copart. I got it through, through the Government Records, Open Public Records Act. It's zoned residential. So how that can be merged with industrial lots, I'd like this board to answer that. Mr. Chairman, the, yes. the, the lots identified on the exhibit to the right, I believe that's A2. If that could be confirmed. A2. Is that A2? That is A2. Okay. Th those particular lots, the applicant has agreed in testimony that they will merge all of them so this issue will never come up again. All of the lots that the applicant has submitted will be merged. Which lots are they? What are the numbers? Uh, the, the, issue, the issue is not what the numbers are. The issue is, Mr. Rydell, whether or not any of these lots, current or former, were zoned residential. Because the allegation is that we have merged a residential property with an industrial property, therefore commingling zones. So, But they haven't been merged yet. So right now it's a separate, separate lot that's being used that to connect Block 73.101 with lot one, and they're crossing over on that lot to get over to 71.1.01. So, that, and this has been going on for a long time. That is a zoning violation. Now, you've also got wetlands on the other one there, and there's no road access anywhere. That's another violation. Why is this board permitting violations of Hillsborough's ordinances? There's other, and plus the, the location of Block 71, Lot 1.01 is Counselor, falsified Counselor, because you're showing, are we violating you're, showing any Sunny, you're showing that as Sunny Mead Road when that is Old Camp Lane Road. <laughs> Mr. What? Weber stated what? that himself in one of the minutes over here. It says, ma'am, whether it, it says that, that is Old Camp Lane Road, whether it's not Sunny Mead Road. Whether it's so Old Camp Lane Road, ma'am. Go ahead. <laughs> Whether the street is designated Old Camp Plain Road or Sunny Mead Road is not an issue. It's very important. Can I, ma'am, 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 listen, that's important. enough. Now you're out of order. Now be quiet. Now you made one thing that has, you know, that would be substantive if it was true about the zoning. Which the rest of it is not important. Now, you've been told that and that's it. Now. You want to come and, and please board. clarify that the this board has not been allowing violations well, of our let's zoning. Let's start the first one. This board doesn't allow because this board doesn't control that. Right. The issue of whether or not there is a zoning violation relates to the planning and zoning department of the municipality and not the board per se. Part one. Part two. I don't believe we can answer at this moment whether or not there is a zoning violation and frankly, it's a discussion I'm going to have to have with the board engineer before the board takes an action on this application, if it does. As to whether or not the street is designated properly for purposes of an application, it's designated properly for the application in terms of the way in which it's before this board. There is no dispute that where the property is located and what road it borders on within the township. The denial or granting of this application is not going to rise and fall as to whether or not something was or was not designated one road versus the other when it is clear from the testimony and from the application where the property is located. The issue that is of an issue is the issue of the zoning designation. That I will not dispute with you in terms of whether or not it's an issue. Whether it is an actual issue is another piece. So that's the best I can answer at the moment. I will consult with Mr. White relative to that issue before I ask, before we suggest to the board they take an action. Okay. Thank Very good. I'd also like to state that um, there were three co-part meetings in 2011. I didn't get a notice. My husband and I did not get notice of co-part meetings in 2011. That is a violation of, our, of due process. We are property owners that should have been notified. So res the resolutions were passed, all this stuff went on. 
We didn't know. Mr. Mr. Novoselsky, who is uh, my uh, neighbor on Camplain Road, never got anything. We're not on the adjacent property owners list for the meetings now. We're, our, our name, Januszczyk, is on there, but not on the list. Mr. Novoselsky's name has never been on any list. And well. this property owners list, adjacent properties or owners list, has three Copart properties that are supposedly merged over here. Why is Copart notifying itself about uh, uh, the meetings over here? Ma'am, the generation of who's on the 200-foot list is determined by the tax assessor of the municipality. The applicant has the right to rely upon the notification purposes for no on the tax list for notification purposes. If it is your contention that it is violative this time because any 2011 issue has long come and gone on any statute of limitations related to an action taken by this board based on that. If it is your contention that the 200 foot notification is wrong, that's another issue I'm going to have to deal with with the tax assessor, but the applicant is allowed to rely on the document, the official document provided by the assessor's office to them for purposes of notice. And I'm assuming, and I expect Mr. Liebling will comment in a moment, that that's what the applicant did. That is what we did. We submitted an affidavit of service, which I believe Mr. Rydell reviewed, and every, everybody on the list was noticed. And I understand that the, the list comes from the township, so that I understand. But on that list is block 70, the, the blocks that are that are here. Why would you notify Copart of your own blocks that the meeting is because about? Because the law requires notification of any property owner with 200 feet of the subject property, whether it happens to be the property owned by the same applicant who is, in fact, before it. And it would be no different if it were Copart, John Smith, or yourself, if you own multiple properties within a 200-foot radius of the subject property, you'd get the same notice. Okay, may I also, um, I had gone to see Mr. Rydell in October and uh, looking for relevant, all relevant documents, maps, etc. So I received this site plan. What is this for purposes of the record? Uh, the uh, amended site plan, lot one in block 73.01. The um, amended, amended application 14 PB. 15 SR. Where is the site plan for block 71 uh, lot 1.01? This is for two lots. We're not proposing any amendments to the site plan for that lot. No, I'd rather not. But this meeting is for both lots. And the application says for both lots. The, the meeting is to modify the conditions of the, of the approval. The, the site plan, they are separate site plans and only one is being proposed for modification. Well, then th we should just have one lot. Why are, they both, why are both lots included on one application? <coughs> because the resolutions of approval for both lots ha require that the conditions be modified. They both have restrictions on operating hours. Also, there were application numbers for each lot previously. If it's being amended, why is there a new application number that includes both of them together? Both because, together. Any because any time you file a new application, you get a new application number. And this is a new application for purposes of amending the conditions. Well, the application, copy of the application that I got shows both application, previous application numbers and then someone wrote in on top with no initialing who wrote it or whatever and uh, just, just wrote uh, 14 PB, 15 SR, Copart of Connecticut Inc. amended. That's the, no that's, that's the number nothing. signed by the planning department upon the application. There's, nothing, there's nothing showing uh, who wrote this. Ma'am, you, you asked the question, how did the number occur? It's assigned like any other application by the planning department. When they get a conforming application, they assign a number. PB is for the planning board, ZB is for the zoning board. That's it's every application. This is nothing magical about this application getting a new application number. Just like if any other applicant came before the board with an amended request that had previously been granted, they get a new application number. Then, then this application number is for two lots. So then all the information relevant to two lots should be here. Also, this application now shows uh, Copart of Connecticut as the landowner and the landowner's signature is Paul Steyer where before he was the secretary. So, and, and there's no 
Still no information as far as the state in which this uh, corporation was incorporated, and there's no information about the stockholders on this application. Every application that's, that I've gotten a copy of doesn't have that information. And now, before does, does Paul Steyer was the secretary, does. now he's the uh, now he's the landowner. So there's a lot of lot of uh, uh, questions about the accuracy, and I'm putting that delicately, of the information that's being provided. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Sure. I am looking at the uh, file for this application and the uh, record of notice, and I find that uh, uh, we've received the request for 200-foot radius um, and have provided uh, that information uh, from the borough of Manville, and those individuals have been notified, and it is the uh, administrative officer for the township of Hillsborough, uh, David Coyce, uh, who is also our zoning officer, um, who certified the list uh, for the uh, township of Hillsborough. Uh, Mrs. Janicek does not appear on that list, which says to me that she is n her property is not within 200 feet. So that she was notified was done, I, I, I presume, by the applicant as a courtesy, given that she has expressed interest. I'm sorry, but there's two lots over here, and we're right over here. If we're not close to this lot, we're close to that lot. We go by and the, the same we thing go Mr. by same we thing go by Mr. the Michelle's legal speech. designation made by the properly appointed and legally empowered people to make those designations. If you have a problem with you, that, you could take it to a court of law. Have, and if a judge have, finds you, you have right, a, excuse me, circle. I'm speaking. And if a judge finds you right, then you will have made your point. But you uh -huh. don't get to just stand there and say that the tax assessor's a liar, this one's a liar, that one's a liar, everyone's a liar, everyone's wrong. You want to make those accusations, then file a lawsuit, and we'll see what the court has to say about them. No. But what is no, done no, here is done lawsuit. based on is done based on people following the procedures that they have. And sorry, but I'm not going to take your word for it that your properties are within 200 feet. If in fact our own duly designated officials yeah, and all duly Manville. due process has not determined that your properties are within 200 feet. I'm in now, Hillsboro, not Manville. All of these, all of this is irrelevant, including the thing about the lots, because both lots are in the application, because both lots have to have modification of their hours of operation. That's why they're in the application, because hours of operation apply to both of them, but I actual understand. physical modifications only apply to one. So uh, there's nothing conspiratorial about it. It's just common sense. That's all it is. Now, do you have a question? for the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, witnesses as to the hours of operation, which is the subject of this hearing. Excuse me, but that's been told to me at every meeting that it's only the hours. No, it's not. The notice that came, there are a lot of issues, and you try to limit it so that nobody has a chance to say anything, and you're nobody denying Nobody has a chance process. to say anything. You're denying you have filibustered for very process. long amounts of time at every meeting, so no, to Ms. say Ms. that you don't because have a chance to say anything is another Ms. misstatement on your part. Ms. Ms. Janicek, the chair's comment is appropriate because the witnesses testified as to the hours of operation now being requested by the applicant. We're only discussing the testimony of the applicant's witnesses just now. There is another portion coming where the entire issue can be addressed by the public at large vis-a-vis -vis the application at large. That's going to be today? Depends on how long this goes. Because, because it seems like the, the hours are talked about ad infinitum and then, whoop, there's no time. No, Ms. Jan and you've been here at all three hearings. The board has gone back twice and asked the applicant to supplement requests vis-a-vis -vis its, its issues. We still have not gotten to the so-called open, what I would call open public forum piece, where the public can come up and discuss or make comments vis-a-vis -vis the application as a whole. You've been through this before. Right now, what the board is taking testimony on, is to the witnesses who have testified as to the testimony they've given. So will, will there be time to talk about the buffers, about what's, what's going on with a residential property? The, the, the border of Coparts 73.1, uh, lot one. Yes. That border, Ma'am, you, you, ma you asked the fence. question, will there be time? The answer is, when the board is done hearing all the testimony, it's going to open to the public to allow comments on the overall application. 
which you can't do until it finishes the public portion of the testimony piece. Okay, well, my, my, and my this, main... this application is about hours of operation. Everything else being discussed that are physical changes have to do with the remediation and the accommodation of the different hours of operation. But so, in fact, all the physical changes are directly related to the main purpose of the application, which is hours of operation. So it is all related, and uh, in any case, this was to ask questions of these witnesses about what they presented, which you have not done. Um, <coughs> so why don't you sit down now, well, because this goes on long enough, it's gone on long enough. Sit down, you can come back up at the end when there's a general comment. You don't have an unlimited right to speak for an unlimited amount of time. Nobody okay, does. I just, I just, Nobody does. I just Nobody does. With the residential, because that wasn't addressed at the last meeting. Fine, and it was you can glossed address that at the now. end. I thought it was addressed. No, why Any questions from anyone else for these witnesses? Okay. Do you have anything else to present? We do not. Okay. Any final comments or thoughts from the board? Can I go home? <laughs> hmm? No. No? Okay. So I just wanted to recap. Uh, the proposal then, in terms of the hours of operation and the various mitigations that have to do with extending the hours of operation, are contained now in this latest communication and which amendments have we made during a discussion to this and the, and the amendments made during the discussion okay which you'll take from the record including for instance instead of propping the gate open between 5 and 11 simply having it electronically closed mm -hmm. why we, that's why we get the transcripts right that's right day. that's right so and it'll be any agreements we've made in addition to that and any stipulations that uh, were made, for instance, concerning the 30-day, 90-day uh, time timeline that you proposed? Yes? Let's get a fire break. Oh, Lucille, you need a fire yeah, break? Whenever you're done. Oh, okay. All right, sure. Before, you mean before the final? Right, right, of course. Okay. Yeah, I'll just finish finish this. So, um, um, so it would be the also what you stipulated about the timelines which would be 30 days for all written, uh, mm -hmm. recount that again, and 90 days for all physical right. changes, such to be affected before the hours of operation were to in fact change. Yeah. With those time frames occurring once the resolution memorialization is adopted. Which would be when, Eric? Depends on whether or not you would take an action tonight and how long it takes to get the resolution done. Okay, very good. All right. Um, yeah, is that, have I summed that up? The list of subhaulers. And the list oh, right, of and that you will be providing the, the list of subhaulers. Mm -hmm. On an ongoing basis. Okay. All right, the, so we will take a, uh, how, long, how long you need, Lucina? Five minutes. Five minute uh, recess for our transcriber. And, and then the public will be allowed to speak on the overall application. Yes, guys? No. Mr. Chairman, we're not, we're not on. Are we on yet, Bruce? I'm waiting for Bruce to get the tape yeah. back up. Mr. Chairman, um, it's now 9:35. A, I'll characterize objector, not a formal objector, but a member of the public raised a zoning issue this evening that she may have raised before, but much much clearer tonight than before in terms of an issue. And let, let it not be said that the board and its professionals did not consider the comments made and look into it. Our initial review is the, the, what I would call the triangular piece at the top of 71, 73.01 lot 1 appears to be in the industrial zone. However, there is an issue regarding the question of whether or not the lots were merged. And because there is a question regarding whether or not the lots are merged and whether they were merged appropriately, we, have, we are asking for this application to be continued until January 15th so that we can ascertain whether or not they have, in fact, appropriately been merged. And if not, we will have to deal with the applicant in terms of the ongoing application. 
We have spoken to Mr. Liebling, who I assume has spoken to his client. We have asked him for a two-month extension through the end of February, which I'm assuming he will grant, and that we can notice this as a continuing application to January 15th with no further notice. But let it not be said that we don't take into consideration those comments of the public. Yeah, well, my point is, is not all comments are equal. Some are not valid, some may be. So we'll look at the ones that are maybe valid and uh, assess them appropriately. Um, so the board needs to then, uh, the applicant willing to grant an extension through the end of February? I have a form right here, yes. Okay. okay. So it'll be extension through the end of February, uh, continuation till the January 15th meeting of the board without further notice. Correct. Correct? Correct. So moved. Second. Um, is that an all in favor? Or? Roll, call. Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Julian. Yes. Mr. Merdinger. Absolutely. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Yes. Deputy Mayor Brichette. Yes. Chairman Dr. Cerisi. Yes. Michelle so, um, yes, oh, I'm oh, me. uh oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the one who looked out for her, you know, to try to get her a break. <laughs> <laughs> this is how that's I get the, rewarded. That's the gratitude, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, <laughs> all right, very good. Then, uh, we'll uh, we'll be back January 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there being no further business before the board tonight, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Merry Christmas. So what should I do? What can I do for you?